Hello once again and welcome to the Amalgamated with Christ Church, where the purpose statement remains the same, to bring people back into fellowship with God through Jesus Christ. And so we continue on the series, we're in part two of two of um, what is the difference between sin, iniquity, and transgression. So sin, iniquity, and transgression represents the same idea. Essentially they represent lawlessness because they go against the very things of God, the things that God said that we are not to do. If you do such things, whatever God command or whatever God has instituted and say not to do, it represents lawlessness. So sin, iniquity, and transgression represents lawlessness. But why the difference though? The difference is the difference, the difference in the words, they are essential to communicate varying degrees. Although sin is the umbrella term which represents the lawlessness, some of these things that we do, either we do them presumptuously, or we plan and we act to carry them out. And so sin, the overall picture, overall umbrella, represents lawlessness. If you turn your Bible to 1 John chapter 3 and look at 4, the scripture says, Whosoever commits sin also commit lawlessness, and the sin is lawlessness. Now, as I said, they each represent varying degrees, but the overall picture is sin. They can each be categorized as a lack of fellowship with God, because that's what they are. Because if you're not in agreement with God, you're going against God, that means you are a lawless person. For example, if you're in your house and your parents say, do this and you do that, then you've done something that's against the rules of the house. You've, you've essentially, you've transgressed against your parents. So, sin goes back to our inner motive. It's a, it's a product of what we're bearing on the inside. It's a product of our heart. Because before things come out, before things are manifested, usually we conceive the notion and usually it, it goes back to something that we're thinking on and something that we have been dwelling on for some time. And most people who have conceived some, for example, covetous ideas, it did not just come forth just overnight. They were thinking about it. And I say it goes back to our inner motive, for example, People who commit acts such as murder or adultery, most often they're thinking about it. They're dwelling on it. So you turn your Bible to Matthew 5 and look at verse 21. It says, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder. And whosoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. But what I say to, to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause, shall be in danger and whoever says to his brother Raka shall be in danger of the council but whoever says you fool shall be in danger of hellfire a lot to describe a lot to go over what I read was just an example to show you that things manifest within our heart it's a product of our heart and we're going to go into it now our thoughts and the things that we do, sometimes they're grievous to the person that it affects. When I read this portion of scripture, I want you to pay special, specific attention to the word raka. It's an old Aramic word. Back then, it, it, meant, it meant, and it still is the same today, but it was a grievous insult back then. Raka means an empty, empty head. So if you look at someone, you're thinking, you have heard that it said, those of you, you shall not murder. But the point is, you said raka back then, it was a grievous, it was, it, was a, it was a terrible insult. And it is something that manifests via speech because you're thinking about it, it comes from your heart. It was a degrading insult. So the act of sin, though, though it goes against and it's grievous, we have to look carefully at it. Why do I say that? Because most often, many of us are doing things, whether they're intentional or unintentional, but if it's lack of fellowship with God, then it, it, it communicates the same idea. It communicates sin. Because you know you can sin unintentionally. We went over that last week. 
in the previous study you can come you can commit a sin unintentionally but guess what it is still sin you turn your bibles and you look at numbers 15 unintentional sin is still sin regardless you can say you did not know but ignorance is no excuse because it goes against so unintentional sin um, look at Numbers 15 and look at verse 27. If a person sins unintentionally, if a person sins unintentionally, you can read it for yourself, right? So though it is unintentional, it is still sin because it goes against the very, the very, the very thing that God says you're not to do. And that's the reason we're taking time to go over this topic that it seems so mundane, it seems so simple, but many people have, are guilty because they do not have a, a, a clear understanding. And as I said, all, although sin overall represents sin overall represents a lack of fellowship with God, we're gonna go into the fine tune, the fine details, I should say. So we have transgression, we have iniquity. Now, what is a transgression? Transgression is presumptuous sin. It's presumptuous because it's a failure to acknowledge the limit of what was set. So transgression is sin, but it's presumptuous sin. Now, some presumptuous things that we do, some presumptuous things that we do, when we disregard authority, we go against the very thing of God. We go against godly authority. We lie. Sometimes you're on the, you're on the job and you do some stuff. You transgress against your, your, against, against your employer. You go against, it's a failure to acknowledge the limit that was set at what was appropriate. So you can be a transgressor because you are presumptuous in your thoughts, presumptuous in your idea. For example, we see examples in the Bible. When you look at the man Samson, Samson was a Nazarite. A Nazarite had certain vows that they had to live by. Let's go over the vows of the Nazarite. And we see that Samson in his later years, he went against them because he wanted to gain the heart of a woman. So let's go back to Numbers. Let's look at number 6. This is the Nazarite. Numbers chapter 6. Describe the Nazarite vows. I'm taking time to go over this because it is simple. There are laws and stuff that were set in place by God. But Samson, though he knew them, though he was brought up like that, he was presumptuous enough to go against it. And it's applicable even to society today. You may know that you should not go 100 miles per hour in a 35 miles per hour zone. But because you want to reach somewhere very quickly, you are presumptuous enough to speed. Though you know you should not go over 35, but you are at 100. You're presumptuous. So let's go over the laws, the Nazarene, the Nazarene vows. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the children of Israel and say to them, when either a man or woman consecrate an offering to take the vow of a Nazarite to separate himself to the Lord, he shall separate himself from wine and similar drink. He shall drink neither vinegar made from wine nor vinegar made from similar drink. Neither shall he drink any grape juice nor eat fresh grape or raisins. All the days of his separation, he shall eat nothing that is produced by the grapevine from the seed to the skin. Simple because they were fermented and they were wine in the end. Right? All the days of the vow of his separation, no razor shall come upon his head until the days are fulfilled for which he was separated himself to the Lord. He shall be holy. Then he shall let the locks of, his, of the hair of his head grow. Now, Nazarite vow, it was very important. Samson was one of the judges of Israel. He was a Nazarite. He had certain vows that he had to live by. He had to obey. One of the vows of the Nazarite or the Nazarene, they were not supposed to touch anything that was dead. One other one, they were not supposed to shave their head. They were not supposed to drink alcohol. They were set aside as holy. Samson was brought up like that. He knew who he was. He knew that he was a Nazarite. Because he was separated, he was dedicated unto God. Now, in, in, in Judges 14, we saw where Samson presumptuously went against the rules of the Nazarite. He went against it. Numbers 14, and look at verse, verse 8. After some times, when he returned to get her, 
he turned aside to see the carcass of a lion, and behold, a swarm of honey bee were in it. He took some of it in his hand and went along eating. When he came to his father and mother, he gave some to them. They also had. But he did not tell them that he had taken the honey out of the carcass of a lion. Why didn't he do so? Because he knew something was wrong. He was set aside. He was, he was supposed to be a Nazarite. The vows were there. You should not touch the, the dead animal. You should not touch any dead body. But presumptuously, he saw it. It had honey in it. It was something good. So he took some. He was eating it. And he gave some to his parents. And he did not tell them where he got it. Why didn't he tell them where he got it? It can be said because they knew of the vows. They would not be pleased with him. And so he did it presumptuously. So what am I saying? Even though something appears to be good and you go against what was said, the rule that was set, you are still termed a transgressor because you did something that was presumptuous. As I said, presumptuous, when you're presumptuous, is a failure to acknowledge the limits of what is allowed as appropriate. And so then... A transgression is the noun for the verb transgress. So Samson transgressed when he did this. He touched the dead body. He touched the lion. Though it looked, up, it looked good. He wanted the honey. He wanted something from it. So people are saying, but it was, he was hungry. He wanted something to eat. That's the same thing people are saying today. You're in a state. You say, but I want to reach where I'm going very quickly. And so you are speeding. You transgress against the law of the land. Now, don't you think when you get pulled over, you're going to be held responsible? Yes, you will. Now, Samson hid his transgression because he knew that what he did was wrong. Many times we're caught up in good intent, but the good intent, it is still wrong because it is a transgression. And when we transgress, we do so presumptuously. Example of transgression. You know, in, in today's society, it may be sexual acts. You know that you shouldn't commit fornication. But you're going out with someone, you know you're in church, but you're going out with a person and you get yourself in compromising situation. And before you know it, you're falling, you're falling and you're caught up in the, in the act of fornication. You're caught up in the act of adultery. You did not go out planning to do so. But you were in the compromising position. So it's safe to say to, have to, to, to get away from transgression, to not be a transgressor, you must be in fellowship with God. Because sin is a lack of fellowship with God. And sin is also lawlessness. So, to get out of the situation, you need to fellowship also with like-minded believers. And an episode of a transgression that was committed by Samson is when he cut his hair. Remember I read to you that a Nazarite was not to cut his hair for the entire period that he was set apart. Now number Judges 16 and look at verse 17 that he told her all his, for all his heart and said to her, No razor has come upon my head for I have been a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. If I am shaven, then my strength will leave me. I shall become weak and be like any other man. Transgression leads you to break down certain things that you should hold there. You should hold certain things there. But because you're in a compromising situation, you throw caution to the wind and you start to spill the beans. Samson was in love. Samson told the woman, told Delilah, the secret of his strength. Samson, with all his heart, you see what he said? He told her for all his heart and said to her, because he was consumed. And so he was presumptuous enough to divulge that should have, what should have been a secret. Because he was consecrated unto God. He was, to, he was supposed to be holy. So there we see that many people today, they are transgressing because of their heart. 
Remember what I said there? The motives usually come from the heart. They are transgression because of their heart. And so it is still happening today. It's still happening then. And so though it is a simple act, something that most time you did not plan to do, Samson did not plan to tell Delilah the secret, but he was in love. Many times people transgress and they did not mean to do so, but they are in compromising situations. And so they transgress, though they did not mean to do it. Guess what? It is still lawlessness. And so we are going forward to iniquity, which is a more serious sort of a deal. Serious sin. Why is iniquity serious? Because it's more deeply rooted. It's not just transgression when you didn't know. Iniquity is something that you are aware of. You take time. You plan. You coordinate. Even though you know that you're going against the norm. Even though you know that what you're doing is wrong. We see people doing that today. They have knowledge of God's work. For example, we see people murdering people, killing people, people indulging and going into witchcraft when the word of God clearly forbid those things. But people will plan to murder someone. People will plan to steal. People will plan to do you harm. People will carefully plan. And this is that transgression when, when, when you just... We are presumptuous enough. This is deeply rooted. You plan to do this. You take time because you want to get away from man. But I said to you, you will not get away from God. But you plan. They plan. They carefully plan. They work it out. It's meticulous. People go in great pains to work out an affair that they're having. They will lay down and they will plan. They will get another phone. They will do all these things. People go through all in, in great pains to plan a murder. They will fly to another country. They will hire a hitman. They will fly to another state. And they will pay cash. They will do all these things because they are trying to cover their trail. But the prophet Micaiah says, when he was talking about iniquity, he says, woe to those who devise iniquity. Remember I said that iniquity is a deeply rooted sin. It's very serious. Iniquity take planning. Even though you know that God forbids certain things, you still, go, you still do it anyhow. Because you want to fulfill the lusts of your heart. Remember, sin, sin is conceived within our heart. Listen to this. Micaiah chapter 2. Woe to those who devise iniquity and works out all their evil on their beds. And at morning light they practice it. Because it is in the power of their hands. They covet fields. You see that? And take them by violence. Also houses. And seize them. So they oppress a man and his house. A man and his inheritance. What does the iniquity record do? What did I say? They take time to plan. Iniquity is deeply rooted. It is evil. Yes, it is sin. But it's the ultimate now all sin is sin because it's lack of fellowship with God. Whether you want to commit transgression or iniquity, if you're out of fellowship with God, guess what? You, you, you're, still, you're still in danger of going to hell unless you repent. But when you view iniquity, because if you look at Psalm 30, 35, 32 and verse 5, the Psalm spoke about, let's see what the Psalm spoke about here, Psalm 32 and verse 5, it says, then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess and my transgression to the Lord and you forgive the guilt of my sin. Psalm 32 and verse 5, it addressed iniquity, sin and transgression. Now we're looking at iniquity. The prophet says, woe to those who devise iniquity. Why is there a woe? A woe is a whole, a woe is a serious thing. Woe. Usually when there's a great woe, there's a serious consequences for the woe. I mean, when you say woe, woe who work out evil on their beds. That's the reason it's so deeply rooted. Because you take time to plan. You do so at your leisure. You're working with the person. And because you do not like that the person get a promotion, guess what you do? You conspire. You hire someone to do them harm. Because you want to get them out of the way. 
The scripture said it. That morning light they practice it. So if we're talking about the actual deed, you may be planning something for years. You may lure the person in. The person thinking that they're safe. And when they're not looking, that's when you pounce. It's happening today. People will lure people in with false promises, false hope. The person think that they're friends. And when they're not suspecting, then they're harmed. Then they're killed. Then their assets are stolen. People will even lure you in. Get you to spend all your money. People will lure you in. Because they want what you have. So the scripture says, woe to them at morning light. They practice it because it is in the power of their hands. You, you, it's in the power of their hands, meaning the person who is the iniquity worker, they sit down, they conceive the thought, in the, the process in their heart, they plan it meticulously, and they themselves do it. Even though you may not be the one that's pulling the trigger, but you are the one that hired the person to do it, you are still a worker of iniquity. Whether it's witchcraft, whether it's whatever, you are still the work of iniquity. Because the power is in, it's in their hands. They covet fields and take them by violence. That's what I'm saying. The person may have assets that you want. You may feel as if you should have had the inheritance. But it did not go to you. And what do you do? By violent means, you take it. But you plan because you want to get away so when the person is dead... Then you just roll right in and you take over. That is iniquity. The scripture also says, also houses and seize them. So they oppress a man and his house. An iniquity worker takes time to oppress, takes time to plan, takes time to do things that they know is wrong because they want to fulfill their own desire. They want to get even though it's not dedicated, it's not, it's not for them, but they want to get it. And that's what the iniquity worker do. Now, you may think that every man, every prophet, every, every man of the Bible, they were perfect. No, they were not. An example is the man David. David was, one, was an iniquity worker, but because he repented. Guess what? The scripture says he was a man after God's own heart. See what I mean? So if you turn your Bibles to 2 Samuel, we'll see what David did. Turn the Bible, Second Samuel, and this is with David. This is when David covet, covet Uriah's wife, Bathsheba. David saw the man's wife and think that he should have her, but she was a married woman. So what did David do? David conspired to get her. David did everything in his because he was king, and David got the man's wife. Now, you can read the entire portion of scripture for yourself. It's in 2 Samuel. I'm going to look in verse 11. And I'm going to look at verse um, chapter 11. 2 Samuel chapter 11. Now, I'm going to start from verse 2. Now, then it happened one evening that David arose from his bed and walked on the roof of the king's house. He was king. He had everything. And from the roof, he saw a woman bathing. He saw her. And the woman was very beautiful to behold. So David sent an inquiry about the woman. And someone said, is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Elam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Then David sent messenger and took her. And she came to him and he lay with her. For she was cleansed from her impurity. And she returned to her house. Now what did David do? David saw the woman bathing. He inquired. He learned that she was married. But yet still, he sent for her. He took her. Meaning that he had sexual relation with her. And he sent her back. She was married. He knew it. He took time to plan. He sent for her. He lay with her. Even though he learned that the woman was a man's wife. A man that was in his own army. Remember what the prophet Micaiah said? They oppressed the small man. They want their feel. 
The power is in his hands. And that's what he did because he was king. He didn't have to go after a married woman. He could have found a woman that was not married. But he saw this woman and he wanted her. And so he sent for her. He took time to do all of that. When people are planning iniquity, when people are planning iniquity, guess what? They're usually filled with lust. Because of that reason, it goes to say, it goes to show you how serious, how serious this thing is. It is deeply rooted and it undertakes a specific mindset, one that is filled with evil and corruption to do so. Now turn your Bible so, to 2 Samuel 12 and look at verse 9. This is, this is Samuel. Why have you despised the commandment of the Lord and do evil in his sight? You have killed Uriah the Hittite with his sword and have taken his wife to be your wife. And you have killed him with the sword of the people. David had the power of the kingdom in his hand. He took the man's wife. You got to read the story. What he did, he sent the man. He, tell us, he told his commanders to put Uriah where the battle was, was the fiercest. He, he, he made sure Uriah was in danger to be killed. And Uriah was killed because he wanted the man's wife. And so he put the man in a position to be killed so he could get the man's wife. And he did. But you got to read all of it for yourself. I'm just showing you that people who commit iniquity will go through, will go through any length. You can be in church, but you're an iniquity worker. You may be in fellowship with God, but due to the loss of your heart, you become an iniquity worker. And you sin grievously because you go against the very thing that God said not to do. And that's what David did. Some iniquity workers are so evil that once they become, they become caught up in it, they no longer have a conscience. It's as if their conscience is seared by a hot iron. And so they continue to do evil. And no matter what you say, no matter how much you rebuke, no matter what you want to do, they are still going to be evil because they're taken over by Satan because their mind is just so made up. And they're sold out to the devil. And so they are such iniquity workers. Yes, God will forgive sin and transgression, but it doesn't matter if you don't reach out to him. It's not going to happen. So let's look, at, um, let's look at Psalm 51. I was telling you, if you reach out to God, no matter how great your iniquity, he will forgive you. And I was making the point that some people have become so callous, so cold, that it doesn't matter. They don't want to reach out. But if you are caught up in iniquity, caught up in transgression, caught up in any sort of sin, and you reach out to God, he will forgive you. Psalm 51, verse, verse 1. This is David crying out. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your mercies. Black out my transgression. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. So David was saying to God, forgive me for the presumptuous sins. Forgive me. You see what he says right here? Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Because iniquity is deeply rooted. So David was asking with sincerity to be washed thoroughly from my iniquity. Look again. You see the address? Transgression, iniquity, and sin. Because sin is the umbrella. Transgression is the presumptuous sin. Iniquity is more deeply rooted. You understand what I'm saying? That's exactly what David, 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 you read it. For I acknowledge my transgression and my sin is always before me. God forgive all type of sins. Doesn't matter what you want to do. Whether you want to be a transgressor, whether you want to be an iniquity worker. God will forgive you, but you have to reach out. And I said some people have sinned so much and have transgressed so much. They no longer... They no longer care what God think. And so you ask yourself sometimes, how is it that some people can do such gruesome act? That his dad used to do it. He come, he's doing it. And his child is doing it. So it becomes a generational thing. Iniquity is in that family. And it will continue unless someone break the chain. Genesis 15, look at verse 6. But in the fourth generation, they shall return 
for the iniquity of the Amorite is not yet complete. Iniquity will continue unless someone makes an effort to break it. Iniquity will continue throughout generations unless someone make an effort and sincerely repent and ask God to block out, to blot out the transgression. Iniquity workers are reprobates because they will continue. Well, not all iniquity workers. Because when you when you become a when you become a reprobate, it simply means that you pre you're predestined to hell. Some iniquity worker are reprobates. Doesn't matter what you do, doesn't matter how much you want to preach to them, doesn't matter what. Those are some of the people that you should shake the dust off your feet and walk away. It may be family members, but if they are reprobates, only God Himself can change them. But if they continue to do what they do, then suddenly they'll blaspheme the Holy Spirit. We're going to get into that. But some people are such reprobates because of what they do, they're predestined to hell. And Romans chapter 1, verse 28, and it says, even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. Iniquity worker does not like to retain God in their knowledge. And so what do they do? God gave them over to a debased mind. To do the things which are not fitting. So you may say, where in God in this time why people are doing such thing to the believers? God is still there. But the reprobates don't want God. The reprobates want to do what the reprobates want to do. Because they're taken over by Satan. And so God give them over to do these things which are not fitting. Being filled with unrighteousness, sexual immoralities, wickedness, covetousness, malice. Full of envy, murder, strife, defeat, evil minding. They are backbiters. And listen to this. Haters of God. Violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things. Disobedient to patients. And you can, to, to parents. And you can read it. And you look at verse 32. It says, And knowing the righteous judgment of God that those who practice such things are deserving of death. Not only do the same, but they also approve of those who practice them. What do I say to you? I said, iniquity worker, if they don't change, they become reprobates, meaning they are predestined to hell. That's exactly what that is saying. And so, though you have iniquity and transgression, there is still hope. Because it's not the will of God for any of us to perish. It's not the will of God for any of us to perish. And that's the reason God gave us his son, Jesus Christ. And those of us who accept Jesus Christ, those of who accepted, who have accepted, even if you're an iniquity worker, even if you're practicing, if you accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, then you're okay. Now look at, first, look at that John chapter 1 and let, look at verse 9, 29. The next day John saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ came to take away the sins of the earth, the sins of the world, the sins of mankind. Whether you're an iniquity worker, whether you're a transgressor, and whether you're just an habitual sinner. So I'm saying to you today, sin is the umbrella when you look at transgression, which is a presumptuous sort of sin, because you know what you still do, and when we look at iniquity, we see that iniquity is deeply rooted. And if you're not careful in your iniquity, in your quest, you may become a reprobate, meaning you're predestined for hell. As long as you're alive and have not rejected the Holy Spirit, or speak against the Holy Spirit, you can be forgiven. And so I'm going to turn, turn my Bible to Matthew chapter 12. I say as long as you're alive, as long as you're alive, there is still hope. Matthew 12 and verse 32 says, Anyone who speak a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven of him. But whoever speak against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him, either in this age or the age to come. I want to read an next portion of scripture to you. Turn your Bible to Luke. Chapter 12. Luke chapter 12 is going to communicate the same idea. But I just want to show this to you. It's going to be um, 
Look, listen, Luke 12, verse 10. And anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him. But to him who blasphemes the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven. What am I saying? You may talk. You may say whatever you want to say. You may be an iniquity worker. You may be a reprobate. You may be an atheist. You may act. You may say things against Jesus Christ. But if, you, if your performance, if your deed is so grievous that it grieves the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit withdraw from you, then there's no chance of repentance. You blaspheme the Holy Spirit. If you die in your sins, you die in your transgression, there is no chance of repentance. You also blaspheme the Holy Spirit. What am I saying to you? I'm saying to you, as long as there is life, as long as there is life, it doesn't matter what you're doing, it doesn't matter what your sins are, because we all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, there is still a chance of repentance. And yes, it may have been a simple study when we spoke about sin, transgression, and iniquity. But I, 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 I believe that it's, there is some clarity to it. Because each and every one of us are transgressions. We may not be an iniquity worker at the moment. But check yourself. Look in your life to see whether or not you work any iniquity. You may plan or may have planned to tell a lie. Knowing it is a lie, that's iniquity. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. You plan, this is what I'm going to say when I go before them. You practice your lie. You look in the mirror to make sure your mouth is going in the right direction. You make sure you can maintain eye contact. You practice the lie until, you, you, until you're living it, you're walking it. You believe everything you say is a lie. But because you're so versed at it, because you lay in your bed all night, and you plan it, and you carry it out, guess what? You are perfectionists at it. And so some people are just habitual liars. You know why? Because they are now becoming a reprobate because they are so lie. They even believe their own lies. They even tell lie that there is no heaven. Tell lie that there is no hell. And so they believe it. And so they are living their best life now. But I say, woe be unto you. The day shall come. Be careful. You may just blaspheme the Holy Spirit. And some of us are transgressing every day. We go out and we put ourselves in compromising situation. Knowing that chances are we may fall because of the presumptuousness of our behavior. And so you better be careful about the conversation that you're having, about the people that you're speaking to, about the places that you go, and about the things that you do. Because you may just be a transgression. And sin is the umbrella which means a lack of fellowship with God. So I say to you, my brothers and sisters, it's time to come back into fellowship with God through Jesus Christ. Amen.